So as Mike said, uh, I'm the, um, the team lead for visit analysis at the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. So here's a sort of a plan of, of what I'm going to talk about for the next hour or so. So I'll give some examples of um, some visualization of some practical things for, for you know, um, some projects that I've worked with um, from users at our facility. Um, talk a little bit about um, large scale viz resources, in particular the ones that we have. Um, and then talk some more about the practical things in terms of uh, data and transformations. Um, look at uh, some of the visualization tools and, and formats that are out there. Uh, different types of data representation. So, um, you know, when you take your simulation data and you want to make get some meaning out of it, how, how are some different ways that you can represent that data? Um, and then a little bit about um, sort of production and, and development work for um, doing Viz. Um, so here's um, one example. This is a, a project that I've been working on um, off and on for about 10 years, actually. So even before uh, I started at the Leadership Computing Facility. And so this is a team that's doing uh, arterial blood flow. So they start with this example on the, the left is arteries in the brain. And in particular, they're interested in what's happening um, in that aneurysm. And they want to understand how the overall flow patterns in these, in these uh, arteries impact particle behavior in this aneurysm that's formed on the wall of one of these aneurysms, or uh, arteries, rather. Um, and so uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it's a multi-scale, multi-physics problem. So uh, they're actually coupling two different codes together where they're looking at uh, using a, a fluid flow, um, fluid dynamics code for doing the overall flow patterns in, the, in these arteries, and then coupling that with a particle dynamics code that's doing uh, the particle buildup in this small uh, region at the, at the, on the wall of the aneurysm. Um, and one of the reasons that that's important is that um, to take a look at the scale of, of the simulation, um, this actually ran on our previous resource, but uh, the, the fluid flow, the fluid flow um, calculation ran on one rack of the supercomputer, and the particle dynamics ran on 31 racks of the machine. So there's no way that the, the, doing the fidelity of the particle dynamics in the entire system is not tractable. Right? There's not enough compute resource to do it. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to, to couple these two different types of simulations, and likewise, um, find ways to, to visually represent data at, at drastically different scales um, in, a, in a coupled environment like that. Uh, so this is um, a climate example, so where they um, started with uh, um, observed data on a, a very high resolution scale. So this particular simulation um, was done on a grid of an eighth of a degree of latitude and longitude. So at the time that this was done, which is a few years ago now, um, it was uh, the largest resolution um, simulation of its kind for a global scale simulation. Um, so regional scales, they, they do get much higher resolution. But for a global scale, um, this was um, one of the highest uh, resolution uh, simulations done to date. Um, here's another example of uh, looking at um, practical problems. So this is, is a, a looking at noise from um, a jet nozzle uh, from an airplane. Um, and so this is an example of working with an industrial partner. So uh, our resources at, at Argonne, are, we work with both academia and other national labs, um, and as well as industry. Um, lots of examples of uh, different molecular and uh, material science types of examples. Um, in this particular one, the two, the one on left and right, are from simulation. Data, the one in the center, is uh, actually data that was imaged at the advanced photon source. Uh, this is a, an example of cosmology. This is a, a dark matter simulation. Um, actually, the image is a little dark there. I'll, actually, I'll revisit this project a little bit later um, with some other examples. But uh, this is um, from an early science um, project, which was one of the, the first simulations that ran on, our, on MIRA, our current um, visual uh, supercomputer at Argonne. Um, and so they were looking at, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, where galaxies and clusters, clusters of galaxies are forming. 
So a little bit about um, visualization resources. So at Argon, we have um, Cooley, which you may have heard about already a little bit, because I think you were using that as a compute resource earlier in the week. Cooley, which is a visualization analytics cluster. Um, it's a 126 node cluster where uh, each node has um, uh, essentially 12, uh, 12 processors and um, a K80 NVIDIA uh, high-end graphics card with 24 gigs of memory. Um, and then each node has 384 gigabytes of, of memory available in it. So it's a pretty beefy resource. Um, and one of the, the key components of it is that uh, it mounts the same file system as Mira and CDIS, which, is our, which are our large compute resources. So that's significant because when you're, um, when you're simulating at uh, this large uh, scale, and you have this uh, large amounts of data that you're computing, it's often not practical to move those large chunks of data back to your home institution to, be, to do visit analysis after the fact. So, um, so Cooley shares a file system so you can write the data to disk and then read it right back off of disk onto the, onto the visualization resource um, for doing visit analysis. Um, it actually also shares a high speed, uh, high bandwidth network with uh, with our compute resources. So um, we have been doing some work in the space of doing um, in situ and real time uh, co-located analysis where uh, simulation is running on the supercomputer and you can transfer data rather than writing to disk, which is the biggest bottleneck um, in the pipeline often. Um, you can transfer data directly to the visualization resource without going to disk first. So we'll talk a little bit about um, visualization algorithms, which is essentially transformations, right? So um, generally when you're storing data for your, uh, in memory for your simulation, it's especially on large scale resources like, like these, the, the data is, is in a format that's um, optimized for the simulation, right? So it's, it's structured in a particular way that you're gonna be able to utilize the hardware um, most efficiently. And generally that means that it's in a very different format than the data needs to be in order to do visualization, right? So there's some transformations that need to happen when moving from the simulation side to the visualization side. Um, and those fall into a couple of different categories. All right, so first of all is structure. So transformations in that space um, are generally related to, um, to, ge to geometric transformations like translating, scaling, rotating coordinates. Um, but in those cases, the topology remains um, the same. Um, and then you have attributes uh, associated um, with the, the coordinates in that structure. Um, and those can be transformed um, um, to create new, uh, new uh, data attributes. And then those also can be combined in several different ways. Um, and then other transformations include um, uh, the type of, of data that you're, that you're dealing with um, uh, for, those, uh, for those structures. Because um, those can be scalar, which is just a single value per vertex, uh, or a vector where it's an array of values um, or tensors, uh, or some combination of those. So when, when we start looking at uh, doing visualization at scale, um, you face some of the same problems that you do when you're doing um, computation at scale, right? You need to uh, decompose the data that in your domain um, to distribute it among the resources that you're going to do the computing or visualization on. Um, and so again, similarly, uh, you know, the, although Cooley does have um, very large amounts of memory uh, per node, uh, often you need to, to break up data sets are large enough that they don't fit in memory on a single resource. So you need to start breaking them up and distribute them. So one way of doing that is to, to use a regular grid, right? Where uh, the regular grid is essentially um, a grid of cells that are, are uh, evenly spaced and even, evenly sized. Uh, um, and each one holds a, a single value per variable. So, so in other words, the, the whole cell holds a single value. Um, so when we start dividing those up, we evenly divide uh, these chunks of data among the available processors, 
And then additionally, you need to include some ghost cells at the borders. Um, and I'll go into a little more detail about why you need to do that in a second. Um, and of course, you need to do this all over, right? So between each of the cells, you need to include these ghost cells um, between neighboring cells. And that's so that you have um, uh, some continuity between, uh, between those cells when you're doing uh, calculations. So for example, if I have this regular grid here um, where each of these, these cells has a, has a different value, and so say along this row here, um, and if I want to compute a contiguous uh, value across this space, um, right? So if I want to calculate it between here, that's easy. I can average, come up with um, the average value between these, these two values, same on this side. But if I want to do this one here between these two cells, if these happen to live on different compute processes, then we need to do some additional work here. Right, because if the data on the left doesn't know anything about the data on the right, then at the border here, the left side still thinks it's four, the right side still thinks it's six. And so when those two are butted up against each other, you're gonna have a discontinuity. Um, and so you'll have artifacts in the visualization. So by expanding this out, where now on the left side, I'm still only going to be responsible for visualizing this, the data on the left, but I store an extra, row, an extra column of data here so that now I know about this value at the six, and I'm able to compute that, uh, the average between those um, two values in order to have a contiguous um, visualization as I go between um, all the way across there. Uh, so another um, method for doing de uh, domain decomposition uh, is to do uh, AMR, or adaptive mesh refinement, where it's basically putting uh, increased de detail in regions where we know that things are changing quickly. So for example, as we subdivide the region, we can subdivide in areas where we know that things are changing uh, more quickly. That, that allows us to reduce the amount of computation that we need to do in areas that are not changing so fast. So for example, up here on the right, if we were to, to subdivide this um, at the finest resolution, um, the same that we're doing down here, if we were to do that across this whole region, we'd have to do 64 different computations and store 64 different values um, for this region. But because we're, those values are not changing across that, that whole space, we can replace that with a single value. There we go. Um, right, so, right, so we can replace those 64 computations and values with a single one and speed up our, both our computation time, um, reduce the amount of storage that we, that, that we take up, um, and also, uh, I didn't say the speed up the, the calculation. So here's an example of, of, of where you'd need to do this, right? So this is, um, a visualization of a, a, a starburst where there's a, an x-ray burst, there's gonna be an explosion on the surface of this star. This is the surface here. So you can see the space up, up top in the atmosphere is pretty much all the same. So we can represent, use a small number of, of grid cells to represent that large area. Now as the, um, as the explosion is starting to happen, this burning front here, there's much more detail happening in here, so you can increase the number of cells that you have. Again, as it increases, there's much more detail, finer resolution of the grid um, along this burning front, still very large cell sizes um, away from that front. Now, eventually, you may get to this point where everything needs to be highly refined, but um, you'll be able to, sp the, getting to that point, um, you know, the previous, previous steps um, you'll be able to reduce the amount of, of data that you need to calculate and store, um, which can, again, speed up the calculations and also reduce the amount of, of memory um, and disk space that's required for um, doing those, comp those earlier steps of the computation. Um, so for another, uh, another example of, of domain decomposition uh, for particle-based data, so 
for example. So this is a case where you have some number of, of particles and you keep track of individual particles um, and variables associated with each of them. And there's a number of different ways that you can decompose this um, domain, right? So for example, you could take and say each, uh, if they're distributed in, this, in such a manner, you can say take some portion of the, of the physical space and assign each one to a separate process. So all the particles that are in a particular region are assigned to a different um, compute process. Um, or you can say that all the particles that are in a particular region when the simulation starts are belong to a particular uh, process and they, re they remain associated with that process throughout the, the whole domain, the whole uh, simulation. Um, and there's trade-offs uh, in, in both of those um, approaches, right? So you need to, to strike a balance. So for example, if we have um, the scenario where each node is responsible uh, for particles within a particular region, um, there's not a whole lot of particles in this, this square down here, but up here it's very, uh, very dense. So um, the two processes for these two uh, parts of the domain are going to have, um, one of them is going to take a long time because it has a lot of particles to take care of. Uh, the other one has only a few to take care of, and so it's going to end up being idle for a long period of time, right? So uh, the goal is to, so, to, to balance that, so that, do some trade-offs so that you're, you have um, better utilization so that uh, you have fewer, fewer nodes that are sitting idle while other ones are still computing. And then the other example is if uh, you're response, each, if each node is responsible for the same number of particles, but if those particles are spread out across the domain, then you may end up having to do a lot more communication because particles in one region, um, if the particle lives, uh, is being influenced by, by particles across the domain, um, there's gonna be, need to be a lot of communication uh, between those nodes in order to, to calculate um, what's happening there. So there's some hybrid approaches for, for, um, for doing this type of, uh, of decomposition. So a uh, quick look at um, some available tools that are out there. There's all sorts of tools available for doing um, different types of visualization. So um, there's visualization packages, uh, applications, like visiting Paraview, which you'll hear a little bit more about this morning. Um, uh, those are both uh, open source, freely available tools. Uh, and they're, they're rather general purpose visualization tools, so they're um, pretty good at a lot of things, and I'll cover some of that uh, in a little bit. Um, there's others that are uh, uh, commodity products, so the commercial products, so that they're, um, you need to pay for them. But, um, uh, and then there's other, other projects, uh, tools, like VMD, PyMall, RASMall, um, are examples of uh, domain-specific tools, so those are um, specifically uh, targeted at material science and, and molecular um, type visualization applications. Um, there's a number of different uh, APIs, the Visualization Toolkit, VTK, um, and, and ITK for doing segmentation and, and registration. Uh, those are, are good for um, Actually, Visit and Paraview are, are largely built on top of those tools. Um, and those are, is, is more of a, a framework for building your own applications. Um, there's other things like that, that leverage uh, the GPU, for example. So we have a, a volume, uh, a shader-based volume rendering application we call VL3. And uh, you'll see some examples of, of some of that. And actually, a couple of the, the the things that we've seen already were visualized using that. Um, there's a number of different analysis environments, including MATLAB and R. Um, there's also some versions, that, there's some tools for doing uh, parallel R. Uh, utilities like GNUplot and ImageMagick uh, for manipulating images uh, and doing um, some basic plotting activities. And um, VizTrails is a, uh, a workflow um, environment for, uh, for building workflows for visualization and also uh, maintaining provenance. So a little bit about um, sort of 
visiting pair view versus VTK, right? So visiting pair view, again, are sort of these general purpose visualization applications. They're uh, largely GUI based, so that you, um, uh, you interact with them in real time and, and use them to explore data. Um, they're both scriptable, so um, you can use them for doing um, batch-based rendering as well. Uh, they're both extensible so that um, uh, you can, they both have a plugin architecture so that you can build uh, additional tools to, to um, expand on current capabilities. And again, they're both built largely on top of VTK, where VTK is more of a programming environment uh, or API. Um, it does have additional capabilities with finer control, um, but it does mean um, you're programming more than, than using a, a, a ready-made tool. Um, uh, may have a, it has a smaller footprint in terms of um, if you're going to try and incorporate some of, the, of this um, into your, directly into your simulation code. Um, but again, it does require more expertise because um, you're bu essentially building uh, custom applications there. So as I mentioned, there's um, one of the biggest uh, challenges is, is getting your data into the right format, right? So the simulation format is often very different from the visualization format. Um, so this, these are by no means an exhaustive list, but um, you can see that it's a pretty extensive list of, of uh, lots of different um, data types uh, or formats that uh, both visit and pair view and some of these other tools um, have readers for. So if you're already um, using a, a simulation code that's, that's writing data um, in one of these formats, uh, you can already load them right up in pair view and visit. Um, otherwise, um, you could potentially, uh, there's, there's other, you could use the, the plugin architecture I mentioned, write your own reader for some of these tools if you have data that's in a, um, a specific format that there's not already a reader for. So again, sort of data wrangling is what I like to call, you know, this uh, concept of trying to take your data and, and reorganize it into a way that's um, um, can be read into, read, uh, into these visualization tools. Uh, so XDMF um, is an XML uh, based a wrapper around FD, uh, HDF5 data. So if your data is in already in an HDF5 format, you can use this XML markup um, basically to define how your data is organized uh, within your HDF5 data and use that to read into one of these other tools. Um, again, with, with VTK, you could write your own, uh, you could add VTK to your simulation code to write out directly as VTK, um, either uh, by linking to the VTK libraries and using the, the library uh, API to write out um, data in VTK format, or uh, the format is pretty well documented so that you could um, write your own VTK readers within your simulation code. Um, you could also write, uh, uh, small utilities to do this conversion on your on your own, you know, sort of after the fact. So um, you can use your own routines to read your data in, and then write it back out uh, using the VTK data structures. Um, and it has both C++ and Python bindings for doing for doing these. Um, so a little bit about organize, uh, data organization. So again, for format, uh, there's the existing tool support. Um, lots of different uh, uh, flavors of, of different formats. Um, you could either use one of these or write uh, a converter um, or write a custom reader for one of the existing tools. Uh, or again, you can write your own vis uh, custom visualization tool using uh, VTK or OpenGL. Um, one of the other things uh, to consider uh, when organizing data, especially at large scale, is of looking at serial versus uh, parallel or partition data. Um, so there's, there's some trade-offs um, between using a single really large file and a small, um, and versus many small files. And generally somewhere in the middle 
is a is a good uh, is the is a good trade off. Um, there's different uh, VTK data types uh, that support this. Uh, again, you can use XDMF for uh, HDF5 for taking um, partition data in this way, um, or you can write a custom solution, of course. Um, so, so there's some some trade-offs uh, between um, doing serial and partition. And so, for example, um, the VTK and Paraview serial files, um, and Andy will correct me if I'm wrong with this, um, are all read on the head node of your of the application, um, and then the data is is partitioned there and distributed to the to the um, to the rest of the nodes. Um, and this that may have changed in the last couple of versions, but. No, it still um, will read everything in, and you have to manually, um, as far as I know, I think you still have to manually do the, create a filter to do the. To uh, do that partitioning. Distribution, yeah, partitioning. Right. Okay. Um, right, so there's also, um, uh, Paraview and, and VTK also have a, a parallel file where it's essentially, um, where you you have a serial uh, a, a file that points to multiple serial files that build up your um, uh, partition data, and so for one example, um, where I where I did this, um, if I had the the it was an unstructured grid um, and a single data f as a single uh, serial file, it was roughly about four gigabytes, um, and in order to read this on 64 processors and distribute it, um, it took more than 15 minutes. I stopped counting after that. So most of that was spent doing the partitioning and distributing. Um, but once I did that, and I was able to save that as a, a PVTU, which is a parallel or a partition uh, VTK on structured grid file, you'll notice the data size uh, went up. Now it's closer to nine gigs because um, it includes uh, some of those ghost cells that we talked about, right, where uh, between partitions. So um, using 64 partitions of that same data set, um, but now when I read it in, the read time is under a second. So enabling, so essentially doing this partitioning, I guess sort of ahead of time or on your own before not making um, the visualization tools do it for you um, can speed up both that load process and then, and also the uh, um, computation as well. So a little bit about um, visual cues when we're, when we're talking about visualizing data. Um, some of the things that we look for um, to help us uh, distinguish data, right? What, these, what are these visual cues? So um, one of them is position, right? So where things are located in space. Um, uh, Length, so how long or how you know the size of a shape, um, gives us some context. And um, these are different ways that uh, we perceive data that we can distinguish um, and make sense of of, of of data visually, right? So um, angle, so the rotation between vectors, for example, um, is a is another example of of a visual cue that uh, that helps us um, understand. Um, understand data. So uh, direction, so the slope of a vector in space. So uh, if you take a vector and, and use a, a glyph, an arrow, to represent the direction something is moving, that's something that our visual uh, system is very good at recognizing. Um, uh, using different shapes to represent different categories. Uh, in 2D space area, so how much 2D space an object takes up. Uh, or volume, so how much in 3D space an object takes up, uh, and then a couple of different flavors of, of color. Um, saturation and hue are, are different aspects of visualization that our, our, that our eyes are very good at picking up. And so these are different uh, categories uh, that we can use to, to um, distinguish different types of data. So you'll see that we use a lot of those things, that, those visual cues, um, and a number of representations that I'll talk about next. Um, so volume rendering is, is one type of 
of data representation that we can use uh, for representing data. Um, so this is a case where um, essentially we uh, take a 3D volume of data and, and represent different points in that volume uh, with different colors and opacities. And I'll explain about that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Um, but these are just some examples. So if, um, for example, if you look at our little mouse friend here, you can take, um, so what we're looking at is essentially densities, right? And so we can take, uh, assign different colors to different ranges of values in the data and use that to represent. So for example, um, this yellow colorish, yellowish color is, represents bone because it has a, a density in a particular range. And then um, this pinkest color is maybe muscle, um, white is, I don't know, cartilage, something. But, it, but so we can assign different ranges of values to uh, different colors and you use different colors to represent them to, to help us pull out meaning in the data. Um, again, this example on the bottom here, this is uh, two fluids mixing. Red is hot, blue is white, uh, blue is cold, the white is somewhere in the middle. Um, and so using color to represent these, uh, uh, these different values um, and using uh, this volume rendering technique. So in a little more detail, what this is doing is, uh, so essentially we have our, our volume and we're gonna cast a ray through the volume and take samples at uh, various samples along this ray that we're casting through. And for each sample, we're gonna look up the value that we find uh, in this lookup table and assign it both the color, so values at the, at the low end of, of the value range are gonna be blue, values at the high end are gonna be red, um, so you can see here in this image, here's where the values, this is a, a dark matter simulation. Um, the red values are where there's much higher density. Um, and this white line here is the transfer function, which uh, essentially sets the transparency. So places where this value is low, um, where, this, yeah, where this line is low means that those values are gonna be mostly transparent. Values where it's high, it's, they're mostly opaque. So you can see that there's some hints of blue regions in here, but it's mostly transparent, uh, translucent. And then the other regions where there's higher densities in these regions here are more opaque. So you add up these samples as you cast array um, to get a final pixel. And of course you do this across the whole volume. A glyph representation, so we're taking a, a 2D uh, geometric object and using it to represent a point in space. Um, so the, the location is, is dictated by the coordinate. So the, the 3D mesh, the location on a mesh or 2D position in a, in a graph or a table. Um, and then we can take other graphical attributes um, and use, uh, assign them to uh, other attributes of the data. So for example, color, size, orientation, right? So. Um, Let's see, in, in this example here, uh, well, these are, are particles that are um, moving through it. Uh, we're looking at the end of a tube, essentially, actually. This tube here, there's uh, blood particles flowing through this tube. And if we look at the tube on end, we're coloring these particles by their uh, velocity. So blue is slow, uh, red is, is high. So the, the particles are along the edge are moving much more slowly than the ones in the, in the center, right? So we're taking, um, taking the, the, the color and assigning it to the velocity in order to bring some meaning here, right? And then in this example down here, we're coloring, coloring the particles by some other attribute. So for example, the, these yellow ones um, are, are platelet particles that are building up, uh, that are activated and, and forming a clot on the side of this aneurysm here. And uh, these red particles are uh, just moving freely in the flow. They're not part of this clot that's formed. Um, so they have different characteristics. And so we're using color, again, to represent um, different aspects of them. So b both uh, Visit and Paraview are, are good at this. Um, they have capabilities for doing um, different types of, of glyphs. Um, VTK is similar, but again, it requires uh, more effort because in that case, you're, you're um, 
using an API and building an environment rather than using uh, sort of the built-in uh, capabilities of these, these other tools. Uh, GNU Plot is, a, is another tool that's good at um, doing these types of things for 2D plots and tables of numbers. Um, you know, so everyone's seen sort of a line chart like this where they have uh, um, different lines representing, um, in this case, not sure what this data is, but um, uh, using these, uh, you know, like the square, circle, triangle as these different glyph shapes that represent um, data points on the chart. So uh, ISO contours or uh, ISO surfaces uh, is another data representation. So uh, this is basically uh, in, in 2D it would be a line or in 3D it would be a surface uh, that represents a constant value uh, within, a, within a data set. So uh, it's the point at which um, a value crosses, crosses the threshold of that, uh, of that ISO value. And again, Visit and Paraview are, are, have uh, capabilities for doing this um, pretty easily, and uh, VTK uh, the same, but again, requires more effort. Um, and to give an example, so in this top example, um, this is actually, um, each color is a different surface, so we, we're looking at multiple uh, ISO contours of, um, I believe this is turbulence. Um, and so we're coloring them by their, uh, their ISO value. In this bottom example, um, this is just a, actually a single ISO value where we've calculated um, the ISO surface based on one quantity, um, but then we're coloring it by another quantity or another variable in the, in the calculation. Um, so an example of, of combining multiple, uh, multiple variables into a single visualization um, to bring more meaning out of it. Um, so cutting planes is a, a, another representation. It's, um, you've likely seen these before. Uh, it's just basically taking a slice, uh, slicing a plane through the data set and coloring it um, by some attribute uh, in the data set. Um, again, visit Paraview uh, VTK, all, all good at this. Um, VMD has uh, some similar capabilities for, for particular data formats. Um, again, VMD, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about in a few slides, um, but it's uh, uh, for doing uh, molecular dynamics. Another data representation is streamlines. Uh, so this is uh, an example of taking um, a vector field that's on a mesh, and you need the, the, the connectivity in order to, to generate this. Um, and it's basically showing the direction that an element will travel at any point um, in time. So it, you start with uh, some number of seed points um, on the mesh uh, and then follow the vector field along, um, along that mesh within the same time step. Um, so here we're seeing examples of how this, uh, this flow is, um, this complicated flow is moving through uh, this artery here. Right, so um, again, there's other, some tools that are, are better at um, are very domain specific, so molecular dynamics, uh, including VMD. Um, these all, all of these are examples uh, that come from VMD. Um, uh, they have a lot of domain, domain specific representations, like these ribbons here, for example, um, that they're uh, very good at calculating. Um, they have uh, uh, a number of different um, uh, different representations like this that are very specific to those types of domains. Um, um, and again, they, they have uh, facilities for supporting many different formats um, and doing animations and, and script, scripting them and such. Um, Visit and Pairview also have some limited support for these types of representations. Um, and again, VTK, anything is possible if you try hard enough. So this is um, a quick example, not meant to scare you, but just to show you um, an example of, of using image magic as a tool for doing um, annotating, compositing, scaling um, images. And so this is a, a utility that I often use for um, building up images that I'm gonna use for an animation. And so this is just sort of to illustrate 
if I take, uh, the result of this is going to be uh, an image with, where I have four different renderings that I combined into a single image. And essentially, here's the four different, or maybe five, I guess, um, different chunks of code that um, tell it to uh, manipulate an image uh, to combine into this image. So each of those sections I highlighted was to manipulate each of each one of these images and add the little text and the scale bar and such. And so, again, just an, an example to illustrate um, that these tools can be really powerful. Um, and then another example of, of combining multiple images into a, a, single, a single one um, that you can then turn around and create uh, animations from. Um, so for doing movie creation, uh, Visit and Paraview, again, have um, uh, capabilities for, doing, for, for generating movies. Uh, and you can either spit them out as a, um, as a movie file already encoded as an animation. Um, what I tend to do is uh, ha write them out as individual images and then combine them later using um, um, some other uh, uh, encoding uh, like FFmpeg, for example, is a is a uh, a tool for encoding images uh, into an animation file, um, and one of the reasons for doing that is that enables me to to have more control over over the images, right? So, you know, I showed this previous example where I took multiple images and combined them into one final frame, um, saving them as separate images without everything, um, you know, sort of in a finished state. Uh, allows me to, to combine those images in different ways for, for different purposes. Hint at, at, at ways of, of manipulating the images like this. Um, often when I'm doing an animation of some sort, I'll do it in sort of segments where, you know, there's an intro part where one part of the rendering is happening and then transition to a different, uh, a different part. And if I want to encode them into one big long movie, um, one of the ways, easy ways of doing that is to create a, a directory that has a bunch of symbolic links to these other segments of files so that you can say, you know, segment one is, is, is this handful of files, and then um, segment two is these, these other files that happen to be in a different directory, so you don't have to rename them all and, and put them all in one big place because, uh, in particular, FFmpeg likes to give it one big long list of images. <coughs> Um, to compile into into a single uh, a single movie, so separating uh, creating a single directory that has essentially pointers to all the images you want in a row um, is helpful. So just a few more things here. I'm going to uh, give a couple examples of um, of visualization for um, not for the final product, but using it for um, as a as a tool, right? So not necessarily for doing you know communicating your results, but so for example, um, here we're using it for verification, right? So I have this um, simulation here of, um, that I mentioned earlier where we're doing uh, fluid flow in an artery, um, and in particular, um, this is a coupled simulation where here you see the, uh, this is the small subdomain where we're doing um, the particle dynamics of particles moving through this uh, small subdomain uh, of the larger one. And in particular, we're interested in what happens at this intersection between the two domains, right? And so I mentioned before that there's a fluid flow calculation, a fluid dynamics calculation, um, and a particle dynamics calculation. And in this image, uh, the region outside the square, outside the square here is, uh, Calculated by the the fluid flow dynamic, the fluid dynamics code, and the region inside this black square is calculated by the particle dynamics, and so, um, and this is the intersection where those two meet, and so using visualization to 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 put these two in the same space, you can see that the so these orange arrows are calculated by um, the one code and the purple ones by by the other, and you can see that they have um, similar um, similar behavior, right? So, and, and likewise, the the cutting plane that we're showing here were calculated by two different codes. 
but you can see that they, they match up. And so um, using visualization as a way to, to do that comparison to verify um, that you're, you're doing this coupling correctly um, is a valuable tool. Um, it can also be very valuable for debugging. So this is an example that I like to show. This is actually the same fluid flow code used for the blood flow, um, but in this case, uh, this is two marine propellers, and they're rotating in opposite directions. Um, and the, the one on the right is in the front, and so the fluid is flowing from right to left. And so as the simulation goes on, watch what happens in particular to this propeller on the right. Right, so, so the team was, was doing this calculation and um, they weren't getting the answer that they were expecting and they didn't understand why. And so they asked me if I could help visualize it for them. And so when I showed them this, I was like, well, this propeller disappeared, what happened? Well, it turned out that they had some bug in their code that where it was not uh, reinitializing um, that value. And so once the propeller disappeared, it no longer had the effect um, that it was supposed to have in the calculation, and so they were getting completely uh, messed up results. And so this is what they were expecting to get once they realized that they had this problem. Um, uh, they were able to do the calculation correctly. You can kind of see a hint of the, those propellers underneath here. You can see that white bit right there. Um, and so as the, so these vortices structures that are forming is what they were expecting to find um, and were not uh, because of that bug that they had. Um, and then one more quick example um, of using uh, visualization as a diagnostics tool. Um, so this is an example of um, uh, the volume rendering application that I, that I spoke of earlier. Um, and we were interested in trying to understand um, the performance of the calculation, of the, of the visualization. And so what we did was, and we were, we were trying to thread it, right, to improve the performance. And depending on how you laid out the memory, uh, that you, how you assigned memory to these different threads, you got different performance. And we were trying to get a better understanding of exactly um, how that was related. And so when we, what we did was instead of, um, so each thread as it, did its calculation, rather than assigning a color based on the, the value that it looked up, we colored it by the, the ID of the thread that was doing the processing, right? And so by doing it uh, this way, we're able to see essentially how the, how the data was assigned to different threads in the, in the calculation. And based on that, we were able to understand, get a better understanding of, based on how the, the data was laid out, better understanding of how the performance was impacted by, by the choices we made um, in doing that layout. And that's about all I have. I think I'll turn it over. Um, a couple of pointers for um, some additional information. Um, I mentioned uh, Cooley is the name of our visualization resource. So that's all I have. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to take some. From what I understand, uh like Paraview and Visit are built on VTK. So can you highlight uh, what are the major differences? Because at the core, uh, they have the same functionality. So like, how is one software better than other, or in what cases this one software might be? Right, so um, that's always a loaded question, especially with representatives of each tool in the room. Um, I think it's largely just semantics. Right, I mean, they, they both have a lot of the same capabilities, a lot of, um, I would guess there's some things that, you know, each of those tools may do a little bit better than the other, but essentially they, they all have, they both have, you know, equal capabilities. Um, Andy, you look like you want to say? I like to describe it as basically cooperation, which means, you know, cooperation and competition. We can use similar stuff and, but we're also competing against each other, so um, saying one tool is better than the other is really a time-dependent and function-dependent thing, meaning that you know we see visits kind of doing better than Pairview in one thing, and we'll work hard to improve on that, 
and well, you know, and we may be better at visit than that as a pair view, and they see something that maybe a visit is underperforming compared to pair view, and they'll focus on that and do that. But um, you know, but it's so that competition helps kind of spur both innovation and growth. But because we're both working on you know based on BTK and similar stuff, we're not really doing a lot of redundant um, reading and files things, which you know aren't really adding a whole lot. You know, which aren't that um, innovative in a way. And it's kind of like, you know, whether you like BMW or Mercedes better, or whether you like Android or iPhone, you know, it's, they both have a lot of similar functionality, but, um, you know, it's, it's more, a lot of times it comes down to user taste and what they like to do for certain things. Right, and certainly the, the interfaces are different, so there's a lot of personal preferences in that aspect of it too, in terms of, you know, what you're comfortable with in terms of, of you know, how you work with, with the tools. So would you share with us uh, what do you use as a, to uh, uh, complete the parallel partition once you have uh, unstructured mesh and you want to partition it onto multiple processor? Uh, is that part of the visualization tool or is that a separate job that? So it, it can be. It can, so you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that, well, actually, Andy mentioned the one that um, Pairview has capabilities for doing that, um, and I'm, I'm assuming that Visit does as well, that you can, if, it, if you don't partition it, it can partition it for you. Um, one place that, that may be a trade-off is that if you're tight on memory, then you still have to load the whole thing into memory on one node in order to be able to do, I believe, in order to do that, that decomposition. Um, there's other um, uh, mesh partitioning um, libraries and tools like uh, Metis and Parametis are a couple of examples of, of, um, of mesh decomposition tools that you can use prior to, to the visualization step. So me, for the unstructured grids, the difficulty is when reading in the unstructured grids, you don't know which cells are going to use which point. So even though you could theoretically go through and say the first n cells go to um, partition you know, process zero, and then the next n cells go to process one, so on and so forth, uh, you can get a good cell partitioning, but you don't know which point those cells are going to be using. So in, in essence, then you still kind of need to figure out, you know, there's no good way when reading in a file that you don't know much about to figure out which points belong, you know, need to be read in and which process. So you, you know, even though you can do potentially part self-partitioning, you would still need to read in most likely points on each process unless you had some smarter way of saying these cells only use these points and, and you know only read that subset. So that's really the trick with um, unstructured grids uh, versus something that's topologically regular. You can just say have cells, you know, in these extents. So it gets it much easier for structured grids. Right, and actually, that's one of the, the the example I gave of the partitioning where it took you know 15 minutes or something. It was an unstructured grid, so it couldn't make any assumptions about you know what points it needed on which processes. So that's why it took a long time. 